My grandmother told me recently about things that she's seen and experienced when she was in her youth. My grandmother is part Sioux, Apache, Navajo, Ute, and another tribe that I can't remember. She's moved around a lot as a kid because her father couldn't hold down a steady job, and her mother and her father, well, that's another story. They would get evicted and forced to move place to place. Her father was able to hold on to a decent job for about six years before getting into a terrible car accident that nearly cost him his life and his ability to move. Shortly after, he would pass away. For those six years, they lived just outside the Tonto National Forest in Arizona. My grandmother always described to me how beautiful her backyard was. It stretched out for miles and miles and even had a small creek running along the backside with multiple bridges and cross points that led to old deserted logging roads and game trails. She also spoke of that when the property was first being constructed years and years back, they had built a small community cemetery on the back side of that same land. A small cemetery for that area that probably held around 50 to 70 grave sites. Years down the road, as they expanded the area and industrialized more and more, they actually dug and moved all the graves that were in that cemetery and transported them to a new grave site. I'm not sure what the point of it was and at what point they discovered, but she spoke about them finding during this time that there was a larger area further back that was used as a native burial ground. It had been largely grown over and lost to man as it was described to me through years and years of abandonment. I was told this was a burial site that dated hundreds and hundreds of years back, far before the property of her family's was ever set. When she was a little girl, her father never allowed her to play back there on that side of the land because of the energy he would describe to her was bad. She could get taken, hurt, or even worse. There were times as she got older, she would wait for her father to either leave or get preoccupied with something. She would sneak back to that area of the land when she could and would always regret it. She went back there a small handful of times without getting caught. She described it to me as very dark. You just got this feeling you weren't alone and surrounded by hostility. It was very uncomfortable to be walking around in. You always felt like you were being watched, like a visitor in a home that you were unwelcome in. That will always stick with me when she told me about that. When she had gotten far enough back, she discovered what she explains as large mounds of dirt and rock. These are very large mounds and they looked well constructed. The first time she saw them, they were further back in the thickness of the woods, but still visible from the burial ground area. That's when she thought the idea of coming back in the early morning with a flashlight while her dad was asleep was a good idea. I explore a little more thoroughly and get a much closer look at those mounds. Even though it was very creepy being back there, it was an immense thrill a total adrenaline rush. My grandmother has always been that kind of lady, anyway. So, when she told me about all this, I guess I shouldn't be too shocked. This is the same kind of lady that goes skydiving, bungee jumping, rock climbing, you name it. She's always been crazy like that, and being the free spirit that she is, this story that she told me isn't the first or probably last time she'll experience things beyond our plane of existence that and her native roots and cultural roots. Her father was half Navajo and half Ute, and at the time worked alongside a few others at this ranch, not far away from where they lived at the time. He was a great dad, she would tell me, but was overly protective of her. Even when it came to the spirits and what my wild grandmother would tamper with in her teenage years, like witchcraft, etc. But I'll save that for later in the story. Sorry to veer off so much. Anyway, so she waited a few days until where she could sneak out at night and have a flashlight handy and ready for an early morning adventure. She went to bed like normal that night, pretending to be asleep, only to wait till the moon was directly overhead in the sky before she made her descent out of her window. There was cloud coverage, but the moon still had plenty of time to shone through. Sometimes, 
casting its own shadows. It was mostly cloud coverage that made for the journey into the pitch black complete. Anything she could do to defy her father and push forward in the face of adventure. This was around mid to late July. The night was still warm from the hot day and everything was lush and thick. It made things even darker. She recalled the walk to just get to the area of land that was uncomfortable. She began getting hives on her skin at points and feeling this burning sensation on her arms and legs like someone was touching her with a hot poker. She talked a lot about how the walk to the burial ground area was even more unnerving. The darkness felt thick at night. It felt like it was alive and surrounding her. There was a strong sense of bad feelings and energy all around. Even more, now that she was enshrouded by the darkness of night. As crazy as my grandmother is, she continued to push on despite her whole body telling her to get out of there. That's right about when she had her first sighting of this creature. She makes it to the back burial area and goes further this time into the area out towards the burial mounds. This is when she was talking to me how it became hard to physically go back there. It was like this unforeseen force trying to hold her back so she couldn't go further, but she did. Once into the small burial site, she said her flashlight's light reached less and less further. The darkness physically became thicker, which is something she had never experienced before, but would later encounter in different scenarios. Again, we'll talk about that later. Here is where things go haywire. Upon reaching the burial mounds, she noticed there were three of them, spaced no more than a few hundred feet away from each other, with small overgrown paths made to each one. These mounds were large, far larger than her. On the back side of the first one, she noticed a large hole that dropped down into the ground on the back of this mound. It was like a hole that then dropped down into the earth. Think like a small outcropping and then a hole that leads down on the back side of this first mound. With her flashlight, she couldn't see where it led to. She just knew it was down into the earth. Every fiber in her being was screaming to get out of there. She knew she was being watched, that this place was full of bad spirits and energy, but she didn't care. If she could just check out the mounds, she would have been satisfied. Just as she was able to walk to the second mound, she began hearing light footsteps from all around her, approaching her. She shined her light rapidly, but never saw anything, calling out and asking who was there. Of course, no response. Right at that moment is when something very large came out of the hole behind her from the back of the mound. She shined her light, and to her horror, what she describes as this large, reptile humanoid creature steps out. Eyes like a cat, sharp and piercing, and a face so hideous and fierce, she froze up. Before I go on, this is the point that I began asking her all sorts of questions of what this thing looked like because even I was apprehensive to believe her in the moment. I know my grandmother is crazy, but I know she is not a liar, and the genuine fear she expressed to me when describing this creature she saw is a little disturbing to say the least. They had had larger scales, a very snake serpent-like face with sharp jagged teeth protruding from the top and bottom. The teeth were long and pointed. Its arms were long, extending further than its waist and had hard exaggerated hands. It had hard defined rippling muscles underneath its thick scales and stood much taller than her. She knew down in her being, in her very inner core, that she was going to die or be taken by this thing down into that hole that it crawled out of. This being that she understood was pure evil and had dark energy radiating off of it so much so that she told me she felt this creature coming before it stepped out of the hole behind her, along with the approaching footsteps around her. That's when this being spoke to her. She talked about never experiencing telepathy before in her life and didn't know that could exist until this very moment. Whatever kind of being this was speaking telepathically to her, that this being lured her in, 
and now was going to kill her. It began to approach her, and that's when she described to me like a large hand that was holding her tightly let go. Her body bolted, and she ran as fast as she could. It was like this unseen force inside of her that drove her as fast as she could away from this being. In that moment, she wasn't able to think or control her own body. It was like God took possession of her to save her and to take her far away from that being of evil. The retreat back to her house was a blur, but remembers being so full of fear and anguish that as soon as she got home, her father had awakened shortly before and was waiting for her return. She was just so happy to see her dad and to be safe, she practically collapsed on the ground in tears. Her father wasn't so angry as he was worried and she told him everything that had happened. Her sneaking back there, discovering the burial mounds, all of that. Her father told her that this is why he keeps her from there. There is an evil that lingers in that area from dark magic and negative energy. That is why it is important to never go back there. That was the event that dramatically changed the relationship between my grandmother and her father. He went from being overly protective and angry to a very deep loving father. Her dad, after that event happened, told her about the evils and demons that exist to protect ancient secrets, rituals, and native practices of not only their people, but many tribes. They exist physically and spiritually. That is why we are supposed to stay away from them. I had asked her if her father addressed the kind of creature she saw, but she said no, he didn't. He did acknowledge that there are protectors of evil, as he called them, that guard and lie in wait like whatever my grandmother saw. Those mounds that she saw go deep into the earth where there is far greater evil. He never talked or explained further beyond that. At the end of the six years, he got into that car accident, lost his job due to paralysis, and ended up moving out of state with my grandmother until he passed away shortly thereafter. My grandmother, during those six years at that place, never ventured back further out where the creek was, and it really robbed her of her adventurous spirit for a while. The times that she had gone out there before were in the day. Why she had wanted to go out there in the early morning hours like she did was because she wanted to see just how active the evil spirits in that area were. It's almost like she had a sort of disbelief in her. She's not a Christian at all, so when I asked her questions about what she meant when she said that she felt like God grabbed her and sent her running, what that meant. It was this force that took over her and pulled her back in the direction of safety, she explained. It was almost impossible to describe, but said her mind was so overtaken by this horrible being approaching her. Deep down, if given the chance, she without a doubt in her mind knew that lizard thing was going to harm her in some way or another. Then she went on to tell me a whole other thing about when she was older, right after her dad had passed, that makes an interesting connection. She was in high school now, and had befriended a group of kids who were considered outcasts. Remember, this whole first encounter happened when she was about 11. Her dad had just passed, so she was very vulnerable and emotional. She had become heavily involved in witchcraft and dark magic through this small group of kids. They even formed their own unofficial coven. Most of her high school was spent furthering her magical abilities, casting new spells, and lingering on the darkness and hatred she now bared inside of her heart, and learning how to summon beings to do her work for her. Shortly after graduating, she had gotten to the point where these malformed, reptilian-like beings would come and visit where she was living. They would scratch on the windows and try to break in the house. All the while, she would cast spells that were supposed to banish them away. It only seemed to draw them in more and more. These beings my grandmother described looked different than the lizard-like being that she saw that came out of the burial mound hole. These were much more disproportionate, had long claws at the end of their hands and feet, and were more toothpick-like, even being taller than what she had seen when she was a child. Equally as frightening, the more and more she practiced, 
the more spells she would cast or try to hex somebody, the more these creatures would be drawn to her. She was filled with so much anger, hatred, and pain from her father's passing that witchcraft was the one thing that really took her away from it all. She was determined to control magic enough to where she could overcome anything, but she never did. When I asked her about the mentioning of trying to summon demons or beings to work with her, she explained that through spells, they were to obey her. She controlled them and they worked only for her, the handler. The more and more she did, the worse it got. She never got to the point to where she had sacrificed humans, but her and her coven had blood sacrifices with several small animals that they would find, cats, dogs, etc. They didn't even go by any sort of religious textbook, like a satanic bible, for example. They were just witches, practicing dark magic in exchange for power from Satan. In turn, it drew a lot of bad energy to her life. Even though these alien reptile-like beings would torment her and try to get in her house, they never did. During my grandmother's early 20s, she had enough of that secret lifestyle and departed from that group of friends and witchcraft and denounced it altogether. She moved over to Kansas for a while for a career and then onto Ohio where she met her husband who just passed away last year. Once she got rid of all her trinkets and witchcraft paraphernalia, spellbooks, etc., and stopped actively practicing, things stopped. And between the time that she had the encounter with the being out of the mound and the time she was in high school and started to practice dark magic, she never really thought about evil or the being she encountered being evil. Even though she knew it was, she tells me how her leaving witchcraft was the thing that really cemented it into her, that the first reptile being she saw and these other ones that came to torment her were all cut from the same cloth. They had ill intent, and if possible, would have killed her. She knows this deep down. My grandmother is also agnostic, where I don't believe in any of that stuff. I know my grandmother is not lying about what she told me. She's just a sincere person so I can't explain what her experiences were like. I just feel like for me, religion doesn't answer any of that. It's highly probable that the natives who built and constructed those mounds by that burial site practiced dark magic themselves. It was more common than we would know, but many hide it. Growing up, my grandmother knew several who practiced magic and secrecy, and that it went back hundreds and hundreds of years. Scores of them would get together in secrecy and worship the darkness, casting spells of protection and illusion, bindings on the burial sites for protection, wards to give off bad energy. It's a very serious part of their culture, a part of their culture that they don't talk about. It's very similar to what the Navajo people experience with what they describe as skinwalkers, people who have given themselves over to evil. It transforms them even contorting somebody's body to a whole new being of darkness. My grandmother's take, which is an educated guess on what the mounds were, and that lizard being is, were evil beings assigned to protect that area. She knows this kind of thing exists in many other tribes and cultures. This is what she firmly believed her father had tried to keep from her and protect her was this evil energy that laid there and waited. For my 18th birthday, I had gone up on a small road trip with my extended family, mainly my cousins on the East Coast, driving from Florida up to New York and back down. Years later, after I had my encounter, I came to find out that a man had seen close to the same thing I had when traversing through the same area. My encounter happened in 2009. We were in Lee County, South Carolina. I can't tell you what town we were close by because I don't remember. I can tell you that it was nighttime and we were not just on the freeway. Even though we were on a road trip, my brother who was driving at the time insisted on taking all these back roads in every state to get a real feel for the area. This caused our road trip to take 10 times longer, which I didn't want. 
We had been driving through swamplands for the better half of an hour, not seeing a whole lot because it's dark and there are not many lights. If you're not familiar with the area, we're out in the middle of the swamps on a two-lane road, just cruising in the summertime with the windows down. My brother, who's 21 at the time, pulled over slowly to the curb of the road. Not even a pull off, but slightly off to the side, and while keeping his foot on the brake, in case another car came swinging in, told me to reach into the glove box. I did. He had brought several rolling papers and some weed. He was going to roll us some joints, and we were going to drive around smoking. But in that moment, as I'm handing him the stuff, we hear this strange screaming noise close by, closest to the driver's side of the car. It's pitch black out here, except for the stars and his headlights. There's not another soul on this road. Maybe five seconds later, after that scream, we hear this noise of something big coming toward the car. I don't know what it was, man, but out of the swamps to our left comes this freaky looking gangly thing coming straight for our car. It was almost gliding in motion, not at all like a physical animal running after something. Even though it made thudding noises as it moved forward, it looked so weird. Instinctively, my brother throws down the weed and swerves back onto the road while smashing the gas pedal all the way down. We were driving his crappy Volkswagen Jetta at the time, which I remember had a faulty knock sensor, so its acceleration was off. We go flying back on the road around this bend and this creature, whatever it was, still hot on our tail, reaching its long arms out to try and grab a hold of the car. Everyone in the car is screaming, including me. Even though it's dark, we can see this thing. It had these yellow glowing eyes, almost white, unnatural looking eyes. Another car comes down the hill in front of us, and the thing chasing our vehicle hops off into the swamps to the right of the vehicle. My brother doesn't realize this yet, and he began losing control of the car. That's when he tried to stabilize the vehicle, ended up flipping the car because he was driving so fast. Luckily, we were all wearing our seatbelts, but it knocked me unconscious, along with my brother. I woke up later in the hospital with a mild concussion where my cousins had worse injuries than me. My brother somehow managed to avoid getting any drug charges because I guarantee you they found his stash in the car at the crash. I guess when each one of us gave identical recollections of the events leading up to the crash to the police and hospital staff, I think they just left it alone. Life ended up going on after that, but years later, my friend on Facebook sent me this thing about scape or swamp. This young man was over on the side of the road and something that looked almost identical to what he described charged and tried to attack him. He got away, but by his accounts in the article of the paper, it's almost to a T what we saw. There's a rough sketch he did of the creature he saw, and it looked very much identical to that. It was also very, very fast. I have no idea what it was, but it really sent a chill down my spine to know that there had been somebody else who's seen and experienced what we did. The best part was at least this young man was even documented by the newspaper. I tried reaching out to this man, who would be now 20 years older, to only learn that he had since passed away in a shooting. I don't know what's out there, and if you would have told me my own story before it ever happened, I'd call you crazy. Now I'm a lot more open to people who have similar experiences as I do and believe in things that the world says does not exist. Good day. Three years ago, when I was down in South Florida, I'll never unsee what I saw walking into the mangroves. I was walking along a small sector of deserted beach, very close to the thick swamps and everglades that opens up right into the ocean. This is one of the many spots of the state where fresh water and salt water clash. I was kind of in the thickness of the swamp, but at the same part in an open enough area where there was plenty of empty beach. As I continue walking straight, I'm looking ahead. It was far away from me, but I could still make out details to know this wasn't a man. Something on two legs, standing like a man, 
walking like a man and moving like a man, walks out of the mangroves onto the sand, and its back is turned to me. It takes a few steps and then stops like it was caught. I'm talking frozen mid-step. It turns its head and looks right in my direction. While keeping its head fixated on me, it bolts off into the swamps and mangroves in just a flash. When it had emerged out of the mangroves, I didn't see it at first. I thought it was just an animal until it came out to a clear view. It was heading in the direction of the water before it noticed me. What it looked like to me was this large lizard man. It had what I guessed was a small tail on its backside. It looked dark and its head was shaped like a lizard head too. I couldn't see any eyes or anything specific about its body or skin because I was walking far away. The movements looked natural, fluent, organic. There's no way somebody in a random suit was just walking around out here in the middle of nowhere. Not even a camera crew, nobody to prank me, no cameras, nothing. The speed in which it took off at back into the Everglades wasn't human either. It took three huge strides at breakneck speeds and bam, gone for good. It scared me and shook me. I really don't know how to describe with words what it was. Florida is home to all sorts of crazy animals. Last thing I would ever imagine is lizard men. There was nobody else around me or near me for miles that I could see. This was kind of out there, not exactly on a big popular Miami style beach. This was very secluded an area that you have to travel through some swamp to get through, but anybody can access it. It wasn't hard, just took about a 15 minute walk. I feel like writing this out is helping me get over it and understanding what I saw. Even though I can understand it, it's like my brain is having a hard time processing the reality of it. When you're told your entire life, things like this aren't real. Well, they sure are. And if you see one as I did, it can throw your whole world upside down. Now, I just need to work on getting over that and living with it. Thanks for being an outlet we can send our stories to and get these off of our chests.